Hi and welcome. So I was working on a project where I was going to try and turn a Morse taper and basically I was uh, going to turn apart between centers using a lathe dog. I was going to come to the tailstock and shift the tailstock off the center axis of the headstock so that I could turn a taper about six tenths of an inch. And I thought at first, boy, this is not going to be so bad at all. I think I should be able to pull this off easily until I realized that the work holding solution I've chosen is not really ideal. And then I thought, you know, maybe I should just cover work holding in general, just on a basic level. Now, a bunch of you are probably wondering, well, why do I want to watch a video on work holding? I've been tinkering around in the shop and working my entire life with my hands. I have a pretty good innate understanding of work holding by now. For God's sakes, even when you work in the kitchen, you got to hold the tomato to cut the tomato, right? But let's say you were working on a part with complicated geometry and you'd spent say I don't know 10 hours getting this part just right you're on your last operation you need to hold it very steady and if you make a mistake you've blown 10 hours of work so wouldn't it be nice if you could have a checklist mental or otherwise that you could run through and say all right I know this part is really secure the way I'm holding it and it'll be safe so that I have very little risk of actually damaging it when I go to do this last operation, because otherwise you waste 10 hours. So I'm gonna cover work holding in its most basic form. And I was surprised by a couple things, especially when I thought about the problem in front of me. And uh, maybe you will be too. Hopefully we can all learn something. And I know I did, so let's just move on and hopefully this will be interesting to you. So first we should look at what the planes of motion are. And don't worry, this isn't going to degenerate into some mathematical treaty. We're doing nothing like that. We're just going to sort of uh, explore what the axes of motion are. And then once you know what they are, you can try and figure out how to stop them. So uh, the z-axis I drew is an isometric, but in reality, the z-axis really is coming this direction, straight out of the paper. So say plus z towards you, minus z away from you. I drew it this way as sort of a three-dimensional rendering. Um, probably would have been better just to leave it off completely. So here is my object and I want to hold it in place. It can move along the x-axis, plus x, minus x. It can move plus y, minus y. And it can move plus z, minus z, which I've drawn this way, but is actually plus z, minus z, this direction. So if you want to hold this piece in place, say you made a two cup shaped holders and squeezed them on either side, this object wouldn't be able to move in the x axis, either plus or minus, not in the y axis, plus or minus, and neither in the z axis, plus or minus. However, would this object be completely held motionless? And the answer is not necessarily, because there are six more axes to consider uh, that you have to take into account or your part might get damaged. So along the x-axis, besides moving plus or minus x, you can also rotate around the x-axis like this, correct? And on the y-axis, you can rotate like this. And on the z-axis, you can rotate like this, both directions. That's plus or minus x, plus or minus y, and plus or minus z rotation. And if I had a cupped holder, it may not be able to move in space positionally, but it can rotate about any of the three axes. And as I'm sure we're all aware at this point, if you're actually rotating around an axis and you're trying to cut that part, that's not a good thing. The part's gonna get damaged, the tools will get damaged. So you have to take into consideration not just X, Y, and Z motion, but you also have to take into X, Y, Z rotation. All right, let's take a look at the example of the part I was trying to make on the lathe. So here's the part I, was, I have center drilled that I'm going to try and turn a taper on. I have cut a uh, center for the left side. I have my live center on the right side. Then what I want to do, so normal operations, when you're doing this, when you're putting cutting pressure, this part is actually held very well. The only axis of motion that it is allowed if this was, if this is the x-axis, the only motion that's allowed is rotation about the x-axis. It can't move left or right in the x-axis, can't move uh, up or down in the y-axis, and it can't come at us or go away from us in the z-axis. So this part is held fixed except for the one 
plane of rotation that we're interested in, in this case the rotational plane about the x-axis. And that's very important um, because, um, let's for, say for example, I didn't have the left side uh, center. It would be really obvious, but now I've added another plane of motion because not only can it rotate about the x-axis, it can also move about the x-axis and come off of my center. So obviously, uh, it would be very good if I had a very important part, if I could just run through a checklist. Can I move an X? No. Can I move in Y? No. Can I move in Z? No. Can I rotate about X? Yes, but I want it to rotate about X. Can I rotate around Y this way? No, I can't. Good. Can I rotate about Z? No, I can't. Very good. So it's covered. So this is a stable setup for the operation you're intending to perform on it. Okay, so now I have the situation where I was going to take my tailstock and shift my tailstock over about half an inch, but I'm going to exaggerate it here. Put the part between the tailstock and the center and turn it. So this one's rotating. This is the center axis of the lathe and the headstock, and the part would rotate. I've got a dog on it, so the dog will connect with the headstock, and it'll rotate the part around these two points. But now you'll notice that I'm not supporting the part anywhere near as well as I was before. Let's take a close-up look. So in the situation when the part is in line, this would be the tailstock side, when the part is in line, this being the part, is in line with the uh, center, it's making contact everywhere on this cone. And so I have sort of infinite support in all directions except for this one. The part can come off this way and the part can rotate this way. But in every other direction I have, I have nearly an infinite number, mathematically, an infinite number of points of contact between this part and this part. Now, when this part goes at an angle, I'm now only making contact in three dimensions. I'm only making contact in two points here at the sharp point of the center and here along the edge of the center with the point, the, the edge of the part I'm turning. And it's literally just two points. Now, mathematically, a point is infinitesimally small. In reality, these are contact patches that aren't infinitesimally small. But what happens is, is that because this is such a small surface area of contact, if I apply one pound of force along this part to cut it in this direction, and this was a hundredth of an inch in diameter, I would be applying, assuming it's not divided evenly between these two, I would be applying 100 pounds of force at that point, divide it by two, still 50 pounds of force. Now picture about the actual forces you're really involved in when you're cutting, say, steel on the lathe. It's much, much more. So what would happen almost immediately is this point would probably bend over a little bit. It would score all the way around the part on the inside in a, a sort of an ellipse uh, over here, and it would score the center over here. So that is not really a good solution, and that's what actually surprised me. When I thought about, oh heck, I can just move the tailstock a little bit, and even if we're talking a little bit, say like this, you still have only two points of contact and it's going to damage the part and the center. More importantly is it's not going to hold the part very steady. Let's go back to the exaggerated example here. In the exaggerated example, when this point rolls over a little bit, I now have a little bit of a gap. When it's pressed up against it and it indents this material a little bit, I now have a bigger gap. Now, this part is free to move by whatever that gap is. It's no longer held well at all. Um, if we go through the planes of control before anything deforms, yes, you have about the same... Uh, it can rotate around the x-axis, which is now skewed. Um, it can move along the x-axis until the other side pushes against it. Uh, the y-axis it can't move, the z-axis it can't move, this way. Um, rotation about the x-axis, which we want, yes it still can do. The y-axis it cannot rotate, that would be this way, we wouldn't want our part flipping around. And in the z-axis, we wouldn't want the part rotating this way either, and it cannot. So, it's good in that it restricts motion in the axes of interest, but it still, once it damages the part, which it's almost inevitably going to do, and your center, 
then the part's going to wobble and I'll no longer have that control that was important. In the solution in axis, there's so this can withstand a great amount of force because all the pressure is put along the edge of the cone on both sides and it's divided along lots and lots of area. So what would be a better solution? And this is what I arrived at that made me decide to talk about this topic. So here is my solution. To put a ball bearing on the end of both sides of my center. So I have to make an adapter for my live center and I'm going to modify the center I cut to hold a ball bearing. Now what happens is I have a circular path of contact all the way around. So it's a line contact instead of a point contact. Still not as good as a full surface contact, but here's the advantage. When this part rotates within limits, I'm still making the same circular contact patch all the way around the inside of this part. So going over a coverage, again, I can rotate on the x-axis. I can move, I can't move along the x-axis when I'm pinned between two of these. I can't, I can't move along the y-axis, can't move along the z-axis, can't rotate on the y-axis, can't rotate on the z-axis. So I've gone through step by step all of the axes of rotation that I have to be concerned with, and it will only move on the ones I want it to. And the contact patch is larger. Still, nowhere near as good as the conical uh, contact, because that is a surface contact. This one is just a linear contact, but still better than a point contact. So. This will allow my part to rotate freely, not damage the part, not damage the center on either side. And so I thought this was interesting. I hope you found it useful and I hope I wasn't too long winded about it. But in future, if you're thinking about something that's a very important part you're working on and you're doing your, you know, an important step, you can think about running through your checklist. Is it going to move in X? Is it going to move in Y? Is it going to move in Z? Is it going to rotate about X? Is it going to rotate about Y? Is it going to rotate about Z? If you can answer all those questions to your satisfaction, you'll know that the part's held adequately. Thanks for watching. Hope it was useful. Hope to see you next time.